Thank you very much, Justin. Um, so what I'd like to talk a bit today about is slightly different to uh, what's gone before. I've uh, put up the provocative title of Improved Photosynthesis, Can It Be a Basis to Yield Revolution? Uh, and uh, um, I'd like to present some of the concepts that are basically uh, in, in composed in that in terms of how can you improve photosynthesis and improve the, the yield potential of crops. And secondly, I'd like to give you an overview of uh, how the new centre of excellence in translational photosynthesis maybe is going to be involved in trying to attempt uh, to, to uh, make some of this, what I talk about, a reality. So what is the, the, the basis for actually uh, thinking that we need a new, new yield revolution? And it's contained in this diagram here, where basically if you look at the yields and over the last uh, 40 years or so, they've been increasing at a certain rate with regard to wheat and rice. We, we look, you, wheat and rice have been increasing at a certain rate, but over the last 10 years or so, the yield increases have stagnated, but population growth has kept going. And so it's led to the notion that we need to do something about improving, improving yields to more closely match the uh, population demand and the yields of, of our current staple crops. And I, I, I provocatively put down here that the first yield revolution was based on harvest index and fertiliser responses, and the second yield increase here may be underpinned by improved photosynthesis, but that may, remains to be proven. So what are the routes to increasing yield? And there's two obvious routes that, that, are, that you can exploit. One is narrowing the yield gap, and when I say the yield gap, it's the, the differences between, between what can actually be achieved under optimal conditions versus what is actually achieved in the field under the, the existing agronomic practices. I'll go is that better? I think so. All right. Um, so you can do things like improving water use, improve nutrient use and supply, improve pest and disease management, and improve agronomic practice. Uh, but that's just to get you up to the, to the yield potential. But you can also take approaches that increase the yield potential, and, and two of those are the, are the most significant ones are improving the photosynthetic efficiency and increasing the harvest index. Uh, the increasing the harvest index is not so important for biomass crops where you basically harvest the whole crop, but is important for, for things like wheat and maize where you're only harvesting a particular organ of the plant. But improving yield potential and, and yield gap approaches are additive in that the, the approaches that are aim, aimed to reduce the yield gaps may be said to capture the low hanging fruit. So um, there's, I think David Lavelle talked in his talk yesterday about we're all used to, to, to improving yield by optimising pest management, optimising water use, optimising nutrient use. Um, but improving photosynthesis is about changing the fundamental rules under which photosynthesis occurs. And I think the, a, a clear example of that was on actually David Lavelle's slide which showed transpiration uh, use against yield. And maize basically fell on a totally different line to wheat and rice. And that slope of that line was, is basically dependent upon a, new, a different mode of photosynthesis in maize versus wheat and rice. And that's what we're talking about by changing the rules, that you change the, the fundamental equations that, that go govern the, the efficiency with which CO2 is captured in, in relation to light absorption. And the good thing about improving photosynthesis is that it has the potential to improve yield under both optimal and non-optimal ag agronomic conditions. So although we talk about yield potential as being something that sets the, the upper yield by improving photosynthesis, there's a potential to, for that to carry through under water stress conditions, nutrient li limited conditions, as well as the most, the best conditions that the field can offer. So what are the, plant, the yield potential determinants? So out of this, we see that basically this is the Monteith equation, but it simply it can be broken down as the yield is proportional to the solar energy incident on the crop times the efficiency with which, which light is intercepted by the crop times the efficiency with which we, that, that light is converted uh, into CO2 capture, and then a partitioning of coefficient, uh, the extent to which the, the carbon is then partitioned towards yield products. And as I alluded for, to in my first slide, that over the past 50 year, years, yield has been increased by optimising harvest index in response to fertiliser. And it seems that harvest index above 60% is unlikely and, and fertilisers are running out. And that leads you to the, basically the, the concept that further increases in yield, crop yield potential, can, can probably only be achieved by manipulating light conversion efficiency. And that's photosynthesis. So does photosynthesis limit crop yields? And the answer is, from my perspective, a clear yes. 
And basically, the evidence for that lies in the responses to CO2. And David Lavelle showed this, that when you grow plants on elevated CO2, essentially what you're doing is improving photosynthetic efficiency. You're basically saturating the, C the CO2 fixing enzyme Rubisco with more CO2, making it more efficient, making it more like a C4 maize plant. And yields in these plants are then, this is the data from one uh, experiment in this regard where, where the yield difference went up by 15%. And if you analyze that, it's due to an increase in energy, uh, energy conversion efficiency of about 18%. And that's due to the improved Rubisco activity. So that, that but, but presumably we can, so one way you can, you can, you can resolve or increase the photosynthetic efficiency is to wait for CO2 to rise, uh, and that will occur with time, and, and I guess we're all concerned about that, but the other way is to take directed efforts to try and uh, change those processes that we know are limiting. So if I, I just make that, for the non-plant biologists in the field, in the, in the audience, just to give you a, a snapshot of the leaf. So photosynthesis occurs in the leaf. Light is incident on the leaf surface here. Uh, it's, it's, in, it's, it's absorbed by chloroplasts that are arrayed within the leaf, within air, and they're in contact with air spaces. And these air spaces allow the CO2 and water vapor and oxygen to inter, 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 interact and exchange with the, with the cells and the chloroplasts of the leaf. And stomata on the outside of the leaves are basically there to, to mediate the exchange of, of water vapor, oxygen, and CO2 with the chloroplasts within that leaf. And it's, it's this process of, of, of chloroplast and, and gas exchange which uh, basically underlies the efficiency of photosynthesis. Well, it, in various places around the world, and, and ANU has been a key leader in this in various areas, there's been, we've had three decades of photosynthesis research that have been able to pinpoint various targets that one can identify for improving photosynthetic efficiency. And this is a slide just to explain the photosynthesis process and where you might look. So light is absorbed by the, the, the light harvesting machinery of the, of the chloroplasts, uh, and, and that has a certain efficiency associated with it. Energy is then produced from that light energy through an electron transport process in the, in the chloroplast uh, to produce energy. And that energy in a separate system is used by the CO2 fixing machinery within the leaf to capture CO2 and convert it into sugars and biomass. And uh, so that you can look at various aspects of the light harvesting, light con energy conversion machinery as being uh, in, need, in need of, of certain aspects, aspects of improvement. You can look at the CO2 fixing carbon cycle enzymes here as, as having various inefficiencies and I'll delve into those in some uh, more or less detail as we go along. But transforming photosynthesis is really about transforming the way in which light energy available to the incident, to the leaf within the field, is converted into to biomass. And at the moment, we only have available a narrow spectrum of light energy here from about 400 to 700 nanometers, which is about 50% of the incident light energy to falling on the leaf. And only about four to six percent of that is finally converted into to carbon uh, fixed by the by the plant. Uh, and uh, the, what the aim of photosynthesis, uh, improving photosynthesis, would be to increase this this energy conversion to something from about four to six percent to six to eight percent energy conversion by opening the window for light harvesting, improving the efficiency of light energy conversion to CO2, and even enlarging the capacity with which the leaf undertakes CO2 fixation. So out of that, if you look at this chloroplast process here, we have various targets that you can set up, and this is both within our centre of excellence as well as around the world that various targets have been identified as ways to improve photosynthesis. You can enhance light utilisation in, in various ways, whether it be by expanding the solar spectrum which can be absorbed by the leaf, or just displaying your leaf area in, your, in a more effective way so that you basically capture more of the light energy falling on the crop. Um, you can improve CO2 utilisation by C3 plants, and I'm, I'm very specific here that, that a C4 plant has already done a lot of this and improved the CO2 fixing cap capability because of its CO2 concentration ability. But in a C3 plant, it's, it's proposed that you can improve the, the CO2 fixing ability by improving Rubisco, creating CO2 concentrating mechanisms within the, the C3 leaf, which don't already exist there, and improving a process called photorespiration, which actually deals with the waste byproducts of the Rubisco reaction, which I'll talk about in a little while time. At the electron transport level, you can boost the electron transport supply through the, the energy producing uh, 
system of the chloroplast here, which uses the light energy, uh, modulate leaf development anatomy, increase our understanding of the response of crop photosynthesis to environmental factors so we can better predict where is the best place to, to make effective changes to photosynthesis. And we can also look at selecting for natural variation within, the, within plants that already exist there so that screening uh, existing cultivars of, of, of uh, existing germplasm for better photosynthetic performance is, is also an option that exists. So what is the ARC's Centre of Excellence for Translational Photosynthesis about? And I guess it could be captured in the sentence of to increase plant yield uh, potential through improved photosynthesis. Uh, it's funded by the Australian Research Council and universities at approximately $30 million over seven years, so it's a significant effort in this field and it involves interactions between the Australian National University, University of Queensland, University of Sydney and the University of Western Sydney at a university level. But we also have partner uh, organisations in CSIRO plant industry and the International Rice Research Institute. So that's what we're in the, in the business at the moment, trying to put this centre together and, and get it off at the ground as a functional entity to undertake some of the projects that, that, that we'd like to uh, explore. We've got a research program that is looked at here in terms of uh, trying to cover the various aspects in which the ways that you can improve photosynthesis. We've got a program to look at improved CO2 fixation, uh, covering how you can fix CO2 more effectively, increasing light energy conversion, uh, exploiting natural variation, and, uh, and also bringing in modelling and field testing performance. And, uh, and the, 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 one of the big challenges is going to be is how we test whether or not changes that we've made at these levels here in regard to, to directed changes which are made through genetic interventions in, in light energy and CO2 fixation capabilities and also selecting natural variants actually perform in the field and how we might expect them to perform based on what we know about models of photosynthesis. And hopefully this inter integrated effort will lead to improved yields and, and the start of a potential to, to actually proving that improving photosynthesis will actually lead to an opportunity to increase yield potential uh, in, in C3 plants. I'll give you a couple of examples of, of how we can um, potentially, uh, uh, what projects we have, have, have involved in, in the, the centre. I won't go into an exhaustive detail, but enhancing Rubisco performance is, is one of our targets in the CO2 fixing, uh, CO2 capture area. So for those of you who don't know Rubisco, Rubisco is an enzyme that, that exists in the chloroplast of the leaf. It's, it's the, the enzyme that underpins most of the autotrophic CO2 fixation in the world. Most of the biomass in the world has passed through the active site of Rubisco in terms of its production. And Rubisco has evolved since times back 3.5 billion years ago when it was an enzyme that had high CO2 levels and, and was exposed to uh, no oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, and it went through a transition where basically CO2 levels fell, oxygen increased, and it had to cope with this. Uh, it's the best enzyme for the job, but it has its faults. It, it's slow in terms of its overall catalytic capability. Its affinity for CO2 is low, and this is the primary reason that, in fact, why, the, why C3 plants respond to increased CO2 is because of the, the low affinity of Rubisco for CO2, and it also interacts with oxygen. So it's obvious then that one of the things that you would like to do, and it's been a long-held aim in, in, in photosynthesis research, that we can improve this enzyme in some way or another to make it more effective in terms of its performance at ambient CO2 levels. Uh, one other thing that relates to cli global climate change is that this enzyme also gets a lot worse at higher temperatures. And it's the reason that C4 plants do better at high temperatures than a wick plant. Uh, so a maize plant, that they were evolved under high, hot, dry conditions when Rubisco is most limiting for photosynthesis. So that improving Rubisco is, is particularly relevant under high temperature conditions of, in, a, in a global climate, climate change world. So that you would like to make it a, an enzyme that had a better capacity to fix CO2, less ability to interact with oxygen, and, 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 and produced a faster rate of enzymatic reaction per unit nitrogen invested in this enzyme. So the sort of strategies you take to it, to, and these are, these are being undertaken in various ways around the world, including in the Centre of Excellence, is you can identify better from Rubisco's from natural germplasm that already exist out there. And there, there's already evidence that Rubisco does differ in its kinetic properties. So that a maize plant, because of the fact that Rubisco exists in a high CO2 environment in a maize plant, has very different kinetic properties to the enzyme in a wheat plant. And there's 
have evidence from that that the Rubisco kinetics have adapted to the CO2 level it's, that it's uh, found itself uh, growing in. And so that by looking out there at a range of Rubisco enzymes from different sources, you may just identify a better Rubisco. Then you'd have the opportunity for transplanting those better Rubiscos into target crop plants. Uh, but if you knew about enough about the Rubisco enzymes, that you may be able to alter the chloroplast genes that code for these Rubiscos to actually make it more effective in terms of its, its, um, its, its performance. But this is underlaid by the ability to actually uh, know that you can change the Rubisco because the Rubisco is actually coded for in the chloroplast of the plant in terms of the large subunit. And, and actually getting the enzyme into the chloroplast and, and getting it expressed has certain challenges, which I won't go into today, but it's a, an integrated process. The other thing that you could get at in terms of, um, of enhancing photosynthesis is that, and this is the, really the, the approach that a maize plant has taken, is you can enhance the CO2 level around Rubisco. So two ways in which the, the photosynthesis has improved itself over time is you, you either change the enzyme or you change the CO2 level around Rubisco. And that you can we propose to introduce various CO2 supply mechanisms into uh, C3 plants to enhance CO2 in the chloroplast. And that might include specific uh, transporters to transport bicarbonate into the chloroplast to generate CO2 in the chloroplast, or specific aquaporin proteins that would facilitate the transfer of CO2 in a somewhat passive fashion across the chloroplast envelope. In, in this extent, we're, we've learned from uh, evolutionary studies that not all, so whilst the C4 plant has done a CO2 concentrating mechanism in a certain way of using a bundle sheath and a, and a, and a mesophyll cell differentiation, uh, other single cell organisms such as cyanobacteria have done it differently. So a cyanobacteria concentrates CO2 by accumulating bicarbonate in a cytosol using various bicarbonate and CO2 transporters that are present in the cell. And confining Rubisco to the, uh, a structure called the carboxysome within the cell. And this is the, set, the region within the cell in which um, Rubisco, CO2 is elevated specifically around Rubisco. And it uses bicarbonate from the cytosol to generate the CO2 within that, that, that carboxysome. So the, 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 the notion that it's not hard to derive that, that why can't you actually put a bicarbonate transporter within, into the chloroplast envelope, this, this position within the cyanobacteria given that a chloroplast is in fact a, a cyanobacterial symbiont, is an equivalent position for the transporter within the chloroplast. And if you, and we've modeled it in various ways to show that given the resistances to CO2 efflux within the chloroplast and the rates at which you could transport bicarbonate, you could have significant effects on elevating CO2 within the chloroplast of a, of a C3 plant. And so we're taking various strategies at the moment to, to increase the CO2 uh, concentration within the chloroplast by, by engineering bicarbonate pumps from various sources into the chloroplast of, of, a, of, a, of a, a model C3 plants. And what is the impetus for Australia in this effort? I mean, basically, improving photosynthesis is a fundamental and untapped opportunity for raising crop yield. Uh, and I think that the, if that's not just our conclusion, it's, it's the, the, the conclusion of a number of groups and companies around the world. And I think we need to explore that. And in this context, Australians are world leaders in photosynthesis research, and we have generated fundamental contributions to this area over various time, over various times over the past three decades. We have new tools available to link laboratory field research and molecular genomics and phenomics and crop modelling together to achieve outcomes. And we have you know, an opportunity with regard to the Centre of Excellence to, to, um, to translate fundamental discoveries in photosynthesis into field and improve yield potential. Um, and there's an opportunity for Australia to be a world leader and I guess that's really the, the aim of the Centre of Excellence is to basically use it as an opportunity to test whether or not we can translate some of the opportunities that we've identified in photosynthetic improvement into changes that are, that are expressed that we can introduce in the model species, introduce those, those changes into to crop plants and test them in the field and really have a, uh, have a good go at working out uh, proving one way or the other whether or not improved photosynthesis can be achieved by these mechanisms and whether or not uh, it's, it's, it can be the basis for a new, new revolution. So thank you.